Hey everyone, welcome to Queerly Recommended, the podcast where we recommend queer films, books, TV shows, and more. I'm Tara Scott, and I review sapphic fiction at the Lesbian Review and Smart Bitches Trashy Books. And I'm Chris Bryant, a contemporary <clears throat> romance writer for Bold Strokes Books. This week, we're actually not recommending anything. This is a bonus episode, and we have guests who are here to talk about an extremely serious issue for our community. A couple of months ago, we put out our usual call on Twitter to see if anyone had any questions for us, and Salem West responded with the question that said, discuss the implications of various state bills to make the publication, distribution, and sale of LGBT plus books misdemeanors punishable by huge fines or class E felonies. Seems an existential threat and the most important conversation we should be having about our literature. And Chris and I agreed, this is a really important conversation and so important that we actually wanted to open it up. And we are thrilled that Salem is here joining us. Salem West is the publisher at Bywater Books and Amble Press and is the co-author of one of my favorite books of all time, Who's Your Daddy? If you haven't read it, I don't know how many times I have to say it, but please read it. (laughs) Welcome, Salem. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We are equally thrilled to be joined by John Copenhaver, author of the crime novels Dodging and Burning and The Savage Kind. Uh, the Savage Kind actually won the 2021 Lammy for Best LGBTQ Mystery. So if crime fiction is your thing, definitely check it out. John is also the co-founder of Queer Crime Writers. He teaches at Virginia Commonwealth University and is in the University of Nebraska's low residency MFA program. Welcome, John. Thank you for having me. Chris. Oh. Would you like to kick us off with our yes. first question i would love to okay for people who aren't familiar can you please describe what's been happening in the last couple of years with literary censorship well first i think you have to go back to well the beginning of time mostly but let's go back to the 1980s and where you really saw a lot of book bans coming about and they perpetuated for a few years and then were sort of beat back down because of first amendment arguments the the right to free speech and access and things like that. And then Mm. what we've seen, given the current political climate in the United States, Mm. where there's been a lot of airing of grievances and whataboutism and things like that, there are several small but vocal groups throughout this country who have really led the charge in in book banning efforts, particularly in the the southern states, but not completely, mostly red states, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Missouri, Texas, Utah, even even some in North Carolina, South Carolina, you know, really all around. Most of them are particularly related to (laughs) books in schools, the availability of books in schools, and they're mostly looking to ban books that deal with LGBT characters or content or books by or about the Black experience, the Brown Mm. experience in in, Mm. in America. A lot of the books deal with topics of racism, of coming out, of understanding sexuality, of transitioning. They deal with incest or sexual violence, sometimes some sexual content. But you see books by writers like Toni Morrison, and 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 you say how how can something this 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 great American writer be banned? But it's one of the leading books. So is Gender Queer, and while they're mostly right now perpetuating it in, in the schools, in the lower school systems, elementary schools and high schools, you're starting to see these efforts percolating into public libraries and into bookstores. Virginia has been discussing a bill to make the selling of books with LGBT content illegal. So you go to Barnes and Noble and you can't buy these books. And as we all know, being queer people, being able to see yourself in a book, to know that you're not alone, to know that there's a voice out there like yours, to see yourself, to hear yourself, those things are life affirming. They change lives and they save lives. So these bands that are getting a lot of power, and we're starting to see le- state legislatures and local legislatures start passing bills. We're starting to see large amounts of funds for school systems being put into, quote unquote, reviewing books. There was one school system, I think it was in Mississippi, that identified 92 books 
that needed to be looked at to decide whether they should be banned or allowed in the schools. They spent six months and spent, I think, $119,000. And they only got half the books reviewed. Well, you know, in a small school system, $119,000 is everything. You know, in North Carolina, the state legislature has just voted to allow <laughs> public school teachers a $250 raise spread out over two years. So think where that $119,000 should really go in really helping the students. So book bans have a very, very deep and insidious effect on, on communities, not just the queer communities or the, the communities of people of color, all communities. It's, it's, it's going out everywhere. So that's why, to me, it's it's such a vital <clears throat> conversation to have right now. Yeah, you know, in a lot of ways, I think it's it's really important to understand the the proposed logic of the people who support book banning because I think it helps, first of all, us understand how people can get sucked into this that might not necessarily get sucked into it, and also help us, you know, I mean, you can see pretty clearly the holes in it. But the argument essentially is that book banners are against government sponsorship. They're like, they always say, we're not, we're not for, it's, this isn't about censorship is their argument. It's about, we don't want government, the government to sponsor books with obscene, and I'm putting that in air quotes, you can't see me, but that's in there, obscene content. And I put that particularly because it's a highly debatable thing, what is considered obscene. So they're, arguing that we just we don't we don't want to censor books we just don't want the government to support we don't want our taxpayer dollars to support books that we don't agree with uh, see their content as obscene and of course what <laughs> what they call obscene is basically our identities but you can see it's essentially a form of erasure and it spreads out culturally yeah we, we talk about schools a lot of the focus mm -hmm. has been there but if it succeeds at that level, it will bleed into publishing and the publishers who are looking at the bottom dollar will be, unless they're a good sort of LGBTQ advocates, if these big publishers will start reducing the number of books, et cetera, et cetera, it becomes this huge problem, a cultural problem, if we don't fight it and see that this sort of sponsorship versus censorship argument is you know, really problematic. But you could see how people get sucked into it. Oh, I don't want to censor books. I just don't want the government to sponsor, you know, books with LGBT content. But you know, that's another huge. It's a huge problem. It's a huge problem that people get sucked into. So, did you hear that Illinois recently banned book bans? Yes. <laughs> so <Go> Illinois. <laughs> so exciting. So exciting. I think Chris. Because trying to do a little bit of reading up to prepare on this, because I'm, I, I think all of our listeners know Salem. You definitely know, but John, you might not know. I actually live in Canada, and oh, wow. so I see the things that kind of like if it blows up big enough on Twitter, I know about it. But right. otherwise, I, I need, I needed to do a little bit of <laughs> educating myself. Sure. But seeing why Republicans didn't like it, it felt almost like they were telling on themselves because. Mm -hmm. They were against the ban saying that it infringes on local libraries' rights. And it's this like, is there some kind of a group that we can pin rights on so that then we can go and do whatever we want? Like saying that so much of the banning trans, like affirming health care for trans youth is about parental rights. Yes. Which like, okay, you get your little ban in place and then go after the adults like in Florida. And it's like... I found it very interesting to see the same rhetoric being put on book bans too. Yeah. When it's like, oh, well, this is all part of the same project. Yeah. And that's the way I see it anyway. Cause when you also see like no fault divorce being attacked in some states, it's like, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So yeah. we're going to go back to like, the, well, not even go back to it, it's, but it's like, okay, so we're going to prioritize the voices and lives and perspectives and experiences of straight, white, affluent men. That's exactly what it's doing. It's about patriarchy, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So I only know a tiny bit about this. And what whatever I know, I probably learned from either Rachel Spangler or Lynn Ames when we were talking about Ann Bannon's books, I've had, you know, conversations with them in, in the past. But it feels like some of this also might connect to or reflect this trying to go back to where publishing was at in the 1950s. Mm. 
-hmm. Does that feel right? And if yes, can you fill that in with facts that I don't uh, well, I mean, presently well, I mean, have easily? If, if, if you're going to go really go back and talk about folks like, you know, Mary Jane Meeker, you know, or Ann Bannon, you know, you're talking about p people who were, you know, getting these bo books published. The books were being published for men, not for women, mm -hmm. you know. So, yes, lesbian content was out there. But uh, the few lesbians who could find them, well, yay for them. But but it it was really for for men. Mm -hmm. That's that's what they were doing. It was their their version of pornography. You know, reading about two women together. So it, it doesn't change. Those books really did. They they launched they they launched everything we're doing right now. But mm -hmm. at the time, you you can't turn away from the fact that the reason they got published in the first place was. Yeah, it's um, interesting. I think the thing that I was kind of thinking of, because wasn't there like there was some kind of a law around not shipping over state lines and therefore there couldn't be happy endings. But at the same time, I don't think I thought of it the way you put it just now. I mean, of course, as soon as you said, it, it's like, well, yeah, of course, what else could it have possibly been? But in that case, you also if that's your main market, you don't need the happy ending because, in fact, they probably wouldn't want to see the happy ending. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I mean, I, I, I think I think it was it was a, it was a time when, when when things are changing and the people who were writing the books were standing up a little bit for themselves. And you know, if you want these books, then then we're going to have a say. But it was mm -hmm. really it was really into the '70s before you actually started seeing the real happy endings, or at least a happy ever after, or a happy for now kind of thing. Even those early books, they didn't quite get to that happily ever after. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, in the 70s and 80s, we, you know, even in the early 90s, they were still, you know, you know, people like um, uh, Anita Marchant and Barbara Greer were still driving up and down the eastern seaboard with their their trunk full of books because they couldn't ship, ship these things through the mail. Or if they did, they had to put them in the brown wrappers so that you no one would know they were in the terms of the day sending pornography through the mail even though mm -hmm. these were love stories and things like that they didn't have graphic sex scenes or anything like that but you when, when you really look at the, this this whole movement of where we've come as as a as a queer culture and, and even a culture with you know pe the 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 people of color uh being able to come out and really start telling their stories and and we're starting to see you know black writers and brown writers AAPI writers getting their day, getting getting seen. The the movements are not one and the same, but they often move along the same the same lines, same pathways. You mm -hmm. know, so in, in a way, what we're seeing is is a way of taking us not just back to the fifties, but also pre Reconstruction. Yeah, that that's really what we're seeing: women being forced to carry children that their bodies may be rejecting or that may put them into poverty states or taking away their right to choose, taking away a family's right to choose. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're seeing all of these things really tied together. And again, it's, you know, it's, the, it's, it's a small vocal group who has a big power in the courts right now. And if these First Amendment challenges were to get to the Supreme Court, none of us really know how they would be adjudicated. We know in the past there's been support for First Amendment rights, and it's been tied to the Fourteenth Amendment and to Title Title IX. So we don't know. We don't know where this is really going. Mm -hmm. So we actually have quite a global listenership. The you know we most when we look at the country with the most downloads, of course, it's going to be in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, but we have many that have kind of surprised us from all over the world, not just Canada and the UK, but all over Europe, Southeast Asia, South America. So I want to pick up, you said that they want to bring us back to pre-Reconstruction. What is Reconstruction for the people who aren't familiar? In, in the United States back in the late 1800s, there was, for all extents and purposes, a, a bloody war, a war between brothers, where different groups in the United States were trying to decide uh, whether slavery was a God-given right or whether it was wrong to, to own human beings. And it became the battle of the North versus the South, the Union versus the Confederacy. It lasted many years. Huge families, families were wiped out. 
it, it left a stain on this country that, that lingers into today. And everyone believed that when the Confederacy surrendered and the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, which was freeing, slave, freeing slaves and, and saying that, that people could not be owned by other people, that we were on the path to reconstruction and rebuilding not just the, the physical infrastructure of the United States, but families and communities and understand churches and understandings. And we now find ourselves, you know, 150 years later, 160 years later, and we're having the same conversations about the rights of people based on the melanin in their skin. But it can be extrapolated to uh, people in the LGBT community, people of different faiths, belief systems. And that's what I meant by it. Yeah. And so, John, I'm wondering if you can also help some of our global listeners too. Like when we think about, we talked a little bit about like, why is banning books a problem? But like, why is it a problem globally that we're seeing our literature, the these attempts to ban our literature in the U.S.? What do you think some of the global implications might end up being? Well, I mean, if you just look politically, we are far from the only country that is dealing with an upsurgence in, in fascist ideology. And mm-hmm. fascist ideology and book banning go hand in hand, right? Because fascism is about controlling the minds of your population so that you can maintain power. Uh, I, if you haven't read 1984, you better do it. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. it, it is a book that describes exactly what uh, totalitarian fascism does. So there's a real interest that across the world in these ideas. So we're far from the only country dealing with political situations like that. And so what's going on with us is absolutely something the world should pay attention to. We're increasingly global and we have to think that way. So I, certainly, I think, you know, the, the, the thing that's so dangerous about book banning is because it is diminishing the ability for people to develop critical thought. Just because you read a book doesn't need, mean you have to agree with it but you never read it. You don't know how to shape your thoughts, your point of view. And so I always find it interesting that the people who ban books claim that they don't like the books because they are in some ways going to corrupt essentially the minds of children or the minds of people. But if your ideology is strong enough would you really be so worried about that corruption? So my thought is maybe really it's about, it's, 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 it's showing a fragility. And I think a lot of this is about a, a loud, angry, scared minority that want to essentially squash other voices, other perspectives. Because there's, there, it's that back to that sort of white straight fragility that's going on. Um, they're very scared their point of view might be flawed. So they, and so I think there is some of that. Unfortunately, they have made a lot of progress and it's scary for those reasons. And that's why, you know, essentially we're talking about it that, and then I do think it's very important for some of the, the ways that we talk about book banning and ways that sometimes on the right, they want to de-emphasize the idea of censorship and expose that for being what it is, which is essentially a, a way of skirting the truth of what's happening. But yeah, I mean, I think the political, the politicians that really are promoting this, like, you know, Ron DeSantis and Florida's, you know, number one, you know, we're looking at the banning of curriculum in colleges. We're, we're, this isn't just about, you know, kindergartners or first graders. This is about high schoolers. This is about colleges. And it's going to shift if we don't push back, shift us as a culture away from, you know, talking about our lives, uh, lives of people of color and those histories. And uh, I think that, you know, globally, that should be everyone's concern. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, 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 I think for me, what, what you hit about the pushback, mm-hmm. that is the part I think that, that really is most concerning to me right now. Because when, when we look around, 
whether we're looking at the legacy queer presses or even really looking at a lot of the major presses, you're not seeing a lot of pushback on this. And John hit this really right when he said, you know, the, 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 these mainstream publishers, these big publishers, they've really gotten into queer publishing and, and publishing BIPOC authors uh, over recent years. But they have this, this, this thing, if it gets to be expensive because they're getting penalties or fines assessed to them, if their bottom line is being hurt in some way, if, if these queer books are, are books about, you know, the black, black culture and black experience, start costing them that money, they're, they're, it's they're no longer a cash cow for them. They have this ability to just go, you know what, we're done with this, we're not going to sign any more of these. Mm-hmm. All right. But when you're talking about legacy queer presses like Bywater Books, like Bold Strokes Books or Bella, uh, a lot of them out there, this is what we do. This is our mission. There mm-hmm. is no, oh, we can quit publishing these for a while and, and maybe you know go back in a few years. We're out of business. If one penalty of $10,000 a day is going to put just about every legacy queer press out of business, having to hire an attorney, even on a nuisance lawsuit, will put you out of business. The operating margins aren't that high. We're not selling New York Times bestsellers. These things are very real. And the readers, our readers, need to have an opinion about this. They need to become engaged in it. They need to go up to PEN America and look at their tool sets that they have up there for people so they can talk at, speak out on, on social media, or they can go to a school board meeting or a community meeting, or when they're sitting at that Thanksgiving table with their bigoted uncle, they can have smart talking points that counter those lies and misperceptions that just keep getting told over and over and over again. There was an article um, on Book Riot back in April, and the, the writer had put out a call to a bunch of book agents for authors and asked them how book bans were affecting the books they were taking on. And that, that was a really interesting question. I was really yeah. interested to see that. A month later, she, uh, the author, I think her name was Kristen Jensen, just wrote a blazing article. She said six agents out of everyone she contacted responded to them. One of them was a uh, an agent for a uh, conservative religious book publisher who turned the, tried to turn the whole thing about how the conservative voice was the one that was really being banned. <laughs> and this oh, author, sure. lo- this author lost her shit. Mm-hmm. She was so angry, and she said, you know, she started talking about publishers. Where are you? I mean, yes, Random House has has jumped in on in Florida on that lawsuit against Florida, but you know they joined Pen America and the ALA on those lawsuits, and that's really great. But I mean, when you look at these other big publishers, where are they? I contacted Ingram, our our distributor, and I asked them, "What are your legislative affairs folks doing?" And they pretty much patted me on the head and said, "Oh, honey, we got it taken care of." Just no, we we really don't, you know, have any ends with any of these governors. But yeah, we'll we'll, we'll take care of it. And that was pretty much their response to me. And I went back and said, I need a little bit more. And they never responded because they're doing nothing. <laughs> they don't care. So we have to. We have to. You know, the publishers, the writers, the copy editors, the developmental editors, the book designers, the readers have to care. If we don't nobody's going to care for us. Yeah, I think that, you know, just to, you know, just to sort of really describe what could happen, and and because I think this is part of our discussion, Salem, was the fear that, for instance, Bywater could get sued for selling, say, you know, Cheryl Head's books, which are just not not obscene or, I mean, just absurd to think about, but Mm -hmm to someone across state lines, someone could try to sue them. Now, the case, if you ask around law, it's going to be a weak case, but it doesn't matter because litigating is so expensive, they could put any small publisher out of business. So I think that people don't understand that. And I think I did want to make that really clear. Like, it doesn't take much to to do a lot of damage. And that's why we, we do have to participate and become more knowledgeable. And I'll be curious, you know, 
what I'd be curious about other instances in the world where we're starting to see stuff like this happen too. Because as you as you pointed out, I mean we're we are we're not isolated as we think sometimes here in the US, right? And so I think these issues do happen elsewhere. But I it's dangerous. And then you'll see trend like you were talking about publishers trending away from wanting to publish these books because they are looking at the bottom. They're, no, it's ultimately a business and they're only that's what they care about. We like to sort of fool ourselves a little bit that companies are these moral machines. They are not. Um, if they see an economic advantage to take a moral position, they will take it. We hope that happens in this case, but that's not really they're amoral ultimately. They're just going to follow the bottom dollar. So, you know, we're kind of at this weird moment where we could go either way. And it's it's kind of terrifying. <laughs> so more we speak about it, more we learn about it, better. Yeah. John, something I've talked to a lot of authors about before, and Chris, I want you to answer this one too. It's just about how writing queer characters, and I think especially writing about our joy, yeah. writing about our day just is like it's no big deal like it's just our day like the the fact we've been able to get away from largely coming out stories to all kinds uh, of stories it's a radical act so john what does it mean to you as an author to be writing about our lives and our and our perspectives yeah well i mean i think in so many ways it's i mean the the aim of any author like i don't care how you identify is to humanize and to create complex, multifaceted characters, because you yourself are a complex, multifaceted individual, and you want the world to understand that no matter who you are, most of us do have many different levels and, and lots of layers. And so I think one of the things that's so important about writing about queer lives is that is an attempt to humanize and connect with readers of all kinds. I mean, I don't think of my reader as just a queer reader. I think of my reader as anyone who's interested in, you know, my characters who wants to connect. And so I think when you are writing that way and thinking that way and you hear people because of your subject matter, which frankly, in my case, I don't have a lot of explicit sex or anything in my books. But it doesn't matter because that's not really what the band is about. Right. It, it's it's about you know, having sort of queer characters with agency who are living their lives, who are, you know, it, it's not just about their queerness, right? It's, it, you know, my case is about solving a crime, right? And so I think that that's, that idea is very scary. So when you say, it's interesting because you, you say that sort of writing about our, our lives or writing about queer joy is a radical act. I think it should, I think it shouldn't have to be, right? <laughs> We're living in a world where it is, right? We have, it mm -hmm. still is. And nothing like a, this sort of thing that's been happening over the past few years to make us realize how like radical it actually is for some people. Anyway, I, I just think that any writer is about humanizing. Any writer who's really attempting to sort of portray characters on the page in a, in a sort of morally responsible manner is about humanizing characters. And that's all we're trying to do. Um, mm -hmm. So for it to be banned, is just sort of, as it, I think it's immoral. So, yeah. uh, so Chris, how, what about, what about you? Especially like, because you're a romance writer too. So you're, right. a, you're in another genre. Right. And I, I actually show, well, I mean, I do have sex on the page. I show love, which is just a human nature. Um, and I show that it's okay to actually have a relationship with somebody within the queer community, that it's it's positive, it can be enlightening, it's beautiful. And, you know, representation matters, especially for the young queers. I just had pride. I just had three days of pride where I met so many young queer people who were, uh, oh, I didn't know that there were books. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know that there were books out there. And it was just, it was so beautiful to see, you know, and I sold, I sold a lot of books to younger readers and it just made me so happy because I didn't find any sort of representation until I was in my thirties. Like I didn't know these books existed. And uh, I guess I just, I didn't know that that was an option. Like here in Kansas city, I mean, Missouri is the third worst banned state out of the whole entire United States. And uh, it's not good here. 
but just to have the the pride and to to show people that you can find books and you can go to all these websites and you can type in what you're specifically looking for, you know, with care, queer characters. I mean, it just, all these little faces lit up and it was just beautiful to see. And I'm like, I can't have people take that away. You know, it's, it's so important to be in front of, of new readers and even existing readers, but especially the young, the younger readers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. you know, I, I teach a queer literature class at mm-hmm. Virginia Commonwealth University, and it's always packed. It's not because mm-hmm. I'm a great teacher. I hope I'm okay, <laughs> but it's because <laughs> there's just a hunger for mm-hmm. these stories. You know, mm-hmm. there's definitely an audience. It's not just it's just not it's not just LGBTQ folks either. It's all kinds of people. Mm-hmm. There is a hunger, and uh, there's a reason for that. I think. That brings, speaking of queer joy, that makes me joyful when I see that much interest in, in our mm-hmm. story, so. That's great, yeah. Chris, would you like to ask the next couple of questions? Um, well, I know that Salem's already discussed a little bit about uh, how bands do impact companies. So do you anticipate that they will affect your company? Do you think well, that that's a, a strong yeah. possibility or? I, I actually did an interview about a month or so ago with a young person, well, young to me, uh, working on their dissertation, and, and their dissertation was dealing with book bans and queer books. And everyone they had talked to leading up to, the, to our discussion had been for either writers with large publishers or with representatives of large publishers or agents mm-hmm. for people who wrote for large publishers. And she asked me the question, how is this affecting you? And I said, well, right now it's it's really not affecting us. People don't know our books exist, really. I mean, people do. We all, we all you know, all of us have, have readers and we sell lots of books. But the, the people who are doing the bands don't know we exist yet. But it yeah. will happen. And it'll take one book. And then suddenly right. the lid's going to be blown off. Uh, we, we've had a couple of books that are on watch lists, lists, but they've never progressed before beyond that. But it's a matter of time. It, it real, it really is. And if if we're not prepared, if we're not thinking about it, if we pretend that this will never reach down and affect us, that that's the best way to to damage our co- our companies. It's a, it's it's the best way to damage the writers who are writing these books and it's the best way to damage the readers who who read these books and who who need these books as right. you said right. right so not a lot of impact right now but i i have to i have to be prepared for when it does happen mm-hmm. yeah it is scary i guess i never it, i shouldn't be surprised that this is even going on because and i didn't even know this like i live in independence missouri and when Tara talked about, hey, we should do this podcast and talk about how, you know, book banning is is getting rampant in my town, just like literally a mile away from where I live, the uh, the independent school district, the ACLU sued them because they banned a book uh, with a non-binary character. And it was cats versus robots. I mean, <laughs> and just because they said non-binary on three pages, it got banned. And it just, you're right. It just takes one person to stir it up. And then it just, you know, we always say, oh, it takes one person to ruin everything. And this is true. I mean, it's, it's, it's true with a lot of things, including book banning. And it's just, and I, I didn't realize just how horrible it is. I mean, we kind of see a little bit like with Florida, you know, seeing all that, you know, obviously Florida is one of the top. I think they're above Missouri. I think it's Texas, Florida, and then Missouri, as far as the most book uh, books that are banned. And diving into it, you know, for this podcast, I was just shocked and surprised that I didn't know more. So that just means, you know, we have to fight more to get out there and have people buy our books and know that we're there. And yeah, so that's going to be my goal now is to to make people aware of this and that we are needed. Our books are needed. One thing that's really interesting is sort of to look at the fight over the AP curriculum in Florida. It's a little interesting story. So I uh, backstory on me, I taught high school for many years and mm-hmm. at an independent day school outside of DC. Um, and I had many conversations about books where conservative parents would come in and object to some element of a book. It was typically a scene or a line or two. Mm-hmm. 
And by the way, in terms of a, a side note, in terms of obscenity law, like the whole book has to be deemed obscene. It really is not because there's a line, a, a racy line, or even, you know, like you're saying, the word non-binary yeah. in a book. I mean, to be obscene, it has to be sort of the total effect of a work of art. And it tends to mean like something to titillate more like pornographic stuff. Like, and that's not at all the books that are being banned right now. Right. I have no relationship to that. You know, but this it's an interesting story because AP kind of caved at first and then they, you know, they turned around and said, no, we're not going to change. And by the way, this this was mostly about teaching about African-American history. Hmm. This is so that's what essentially this they wanted to eradicate from the AP curriculum mm -hmm. um, and stuff from AP psych as, as well, having to do with gender, I believe. And at first, AP almost caved a little bit. Because once again, they're a big corporation and want to make money. They did turn around. So yay for that. And they're not going to change anything. But it's a scary thing to think about that they almost did that. Because, you know, we're not just dealing with banning a book. We're talking about banning curriculum. And you can think about the many, many books uh, like Tennessee Coates's book mm -hmm. that has been banned. I guess someone mentioned that. And, you know, I think you're looking at droves of books, you know? And so in a lot of ways, to, to see this issue is just about banning a book or this, or, or to see it just about a, a, a line in a book, or it's not true. I mean, there's this is about a movement, politically backed movement to eradicate our histories, eradicate even discussion of our identities. And so, it is incredibly important to pay attention to it. And and, and maybe in, in a way that you're looking at from it all, all different, you know, manners. Um, I'm, I don't mean to ramble on too much, but I have to tell this story, this story about what happened once when I was teaching high school. So there's an objection to teaching the first play in the, in the um, Angels in America plays. Um, and, and it's centered around one line, which it was basically a stage direction, where it was like basically, you know, uh, one guy fucks the other guy in the bushes or something like that. And it's like one line. And so uh, we had a mother come in. She wasn't even the mother who objected to it. She was a representative for the mother. <laughs> so interesting. And, you know, asked a bunch of questions about why we, we were teaching this book. And, you know, I went into the detail. I was a chair of the department at the time. I wasn't actually teaching it. I was just supporting the teacher who was teaching it. By the way, it was a straight teacher. So that was really interesting. And, you know, we talked about the AIDS crisis and the importance of the book and et cetera, et cetera. And in the midst of this conversation, we were sort of talking about her child and how her child was a huge fan of Game of Thrones. And my <laughs> jaw dropped. Because if you know anything about Game of Thrones, <laughs> yeah. graphic sexual violence mm -hmm. on that show and you're like what here's it's just a little example of the disconnect so we're going to complain about stage direction in a significant literary work but we're fine with our kids watching game of thrones and I keep on thinking about that with this book banning thing the argument that your children are not being exposed to even pornography it, it, i mean you, you have to look at their access to all everything right. online has to offer good and bad and and think about how ridiculous this book banning thing really is. Because then when you expose it, you kind of puncture it that way, you start realizing that you, you realize this is ideological. This is about politics. This is not about raising children. <laughs> right. right. Okay, I'll shut up. <laughs> well, I, just, I just want to bring up the one thing, because we have been talking about you know educators and publishers and writers and, and all these folks, but, but I want to bring up the one other group that is really being just affected. And those are the illustrators, illustrators of queer books or of books that deal with slavery or uh, incest or sexual violence, things like that. Um, the illustrated book of The Handmaid's Tale, because that's that's a line too far. The illustrated version of The Bluest Eye, because that's a that's a bridge too far. So it's it's it, it also brings in another part of the industry. And then once you start going to illustrators, then you're going to start going to filmmakers and television. And of course, there's always been music. 
So it's a slippery slope and we're really hurtling <laughs> downhill fast. And it's a little it's a little terrifying with the way we've gone from owning the media that like being able to own say DVDs or if, you know to date myself and frankly everyone on this call VHS <laughs> or um what? you know having records or cassette tapes or CDs to listen to to where now it's all like it's Spotify, it's Netflix, it's Disney Plus, it's and we're seeing shows being taken off in some cases, especially for animation, it's affected um some animated shows with queer characters more, but also it's just this like greedy naked capitalism. Mm-hmm. And if they feel like their bottom line is going to be hit by government regulation it's easier to pull it down. The thing that I find wild with some of this, I mean, looking at say Target and Bud Light, those are the the really easy examples right now to point to because they blew up so big. Mm -hmm. But the majority of Americans do support LGBTQ people. And because it's this like loud vocal minority, they're being swayed by, and I mean, I sort of get it with Target a tiny bit because like, Yeah, I wouldn't want, if I had a business, I wouldn't want my employees to be threatened with physical violence either. But also by caving, it's showing this small vocal majority that they can punch above their weight. Mm -hmm. It worked. If it worked, I mean, if you, if you, it's a, like a a hostage negotiation. Yeah. If you give in there, it works, you know, you're, you're just asking for more of it down the line. Mm-hmm. they're just getting louder yeah they're really getting louder i will i want to say something this is kind of uh, an interesting thing that kind of goes with the game of thrones that we were talking about john i did a winona erp co- um, convention i had a vendor table set up for winona erp and i don't know if anybody's familiar with the show what it has it has like a really positive queer couple that have a happy ending i'm not spoiling i mean the whole series is over and has been for a while so I had my books on display. I write romance. So sometimes the 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 books are uh, the covers are a little risque. I say I say risque is that even a word that we use anymore? <laughs> I mean, there I'm showing my age. Mm-hmm. Um but they you know, there's there's hints of sexuality on the on the covers. And I had like, you know, like what do you do when you have a conferences and conventions, you have like a booth and you have like little gadgets and toys and you have like candy for people mm-hmm. to get them to come over to the booth so you can sell your books or sell whatever. And uh, there was a booth, there were five, there were six tables, that only six vendors and we were spaced apart because I think this was like, like the year after, I think it was like 2021. And so because of the pandemic, so they spaced us out. And uh, this lady would never let her kids come over to my booth. And I had these cute little Rubik's cubes and they, this little girl comes over and she wanted to play with little little Moshi's. I'm like, you can have that. And the mom's like, absolutely not. Like, I do not want my children over here by your booth. Mm. And I'm like, but you let them watch Winona. They're dressed up in character. You know, Winona Earp has, you know, some pretty like sexual moments in the show. And I'm just like, as like how is it violence yes and violence and it's just like and they shoot and kill and there's hell and it's, i'm just like wow she came at me for a book with a character holding a bra and i'm just like okay well that's interesting you know it's the same situation it's like well you know you're watching a show where there's queer people you know there's all this violence and yet you're worried about a book cover of mine and you know you're not going to read my stuff i don't care about that but i mean you're trying to censor me in front of all these people and it's just like i was just shocked i was so surprised that's not even your most risque book i know rude. <laughs> so rude. <Very> rude. <laughs> so risque i'm sorry <laughs> all right i, I think there's that a, a lot of that sort of idea of uh parental rights is a right. you can sort of substitute rights for control mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i think that that there's a real sort of emotional thing going on with parents, I think, particularly, at, you know, the past few years, but I've seen it through my teaching career year after year, the sort of desire to control and sort of their children's lives. Somewhat it's come, it often comes out of a sense of protection 
but the overwhelming act is that of control. And it does not actually work well right. for the children. <laughs> And uh, tend, they tend, the more control they uh, assert, the more the children seek out right. other and often more problematic. And I was like, wouldn't you rather have a teacher talk to your child about this material than they find about it, uh, find out about it online in some dark corner? Right. And I just never understand the, why that isn't, you know, I, I think there's sort of a little lie they're telling themselves that their children are simply not going to access that stuff. And I'm, I'm like, well, th- you're going to really have to control them then mm-hmm. <laughs> in scary ways, which won't be good for them. So, you know, it's interesting to think about this, particularly interesting to think about all these documentaries coming out right now about like cults and re- religious right and all this stuff. Where Shiny, that kind of happy people. Shiny, Shiny, happy, happy people. Shiny, happy people. We were talking yes. about it last week. Chris watched it. I was talking about how I was really proud of myself for being uh, so far along my healing journey of religious trauma that I was like, I don't need to watch this. <laughs> and Chris was talking about the things that surprised her. And I was like, oh, none of this surprises me at all. <laughs> like, at all. I was not involved in like that Duggar level, but like the churches I grew up in were just one or two down. And so when I see a lot of the rhetoric about like, oh, drag queens are groomers and queer people are groomers. And it's like, you're telling on yourself, nobody grooms more (laughs) than the evangelical church. And again, to kind of emphasize, like, I'm in a good place with my parents, you know, they're still in the church and we, you know, we respect each other and our positions, but like, I didn't, I couldn't acknowledge that I was queer until my thirties and it was because of literature. And it was because my husband was like, Hey, you're reading a lot of lesbian books. Do you think you might be bisexual? (laughs) And it's like the label I eventually landed on was is pansexual, but like, yeah, he was right. I couldn't, it didn't even feel possible. And yet I was drawn to these books and I needed, he actually, cause I was still in the church at the time. And he said, it's okay if you are. Like, I'm not worried about it. And you're not going to go to hell. And like, I literally needed the permission to consider it because the indoctrination went so deep. And if that happened to me, how many other people did that happen to? Many. (laughs) So many. So many. So we have one last question um, that I want to get into. And I want to set it up a little bit. And I think there are some people that might, feel like it's alarmist but I actually don't think that it is the Lemkin Institute is uh it's it's basically an anti-genocide institute and it's named after Raphael Lemkin he actually coined the word genocide in the 20th century and they've been covering LGBTQ issues a lot and this especially came up with trans people and what's been called for there and you know there's a real concern that the far far right is calling for a genocide on trans people. And by Mm -hmm. extension, I think we should actually be saying LGBTQ people Mm -hmm. because one of the things that Lemkin firmly believed is everybody thinks of genocide as a physical thing, but physical genocide is actually happens after there is a cultural genocide. And Mm -hmm. I think that's where we are. And I think we need to take it that seriously. And so taking that into consideration. And also at the same time, like we were mentioning, it's a very small vocal minority. It was something like only 11 people that were responsible for something like around 60% of the books that have been banned fairly recently. And so it's like, we're talking about a cultural genocide by a small, highly coordinated, very well-funded group of individuals. What can everyone else do? I I just described a very dark situation, but frankly, we are in a dark situation. Mm -hmm. What can we do to move through this? What can we do to make sure that it doesn't, like that this genocide doesn't succeed, that we can continue to thrive? And when we look at it in the United States, but also people all over the world, what can they do? John, would you like to? Sure. Um, I think that first first and foremost, get educated. Um, you know, I'm continuing to learn about the, you know, current situation 
um, looking at the different laws that are being passed in the states um, and their impact. I think it's also important to dive into the history of it as well, just so you can see how it happened before and the, the, you can sort of see the motives for it happening before. I think build allyships. Uh, mm -hmm. We need our allies more now than ever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that can be individuals. Hopefully it can also be corporations that, you know, we'll see perhaps there's enough <laughs> reason to support uh, our causes. I do think we have to think in those terms. Of course, by, you know, LGBTQ and support LGBTQ writers, uh, however you can support your educators you know i think that you do need to get out there I, I think one of the things that i've seen consistently in my career as an educator is that we have a very loud angry aggressive conservative groups of people and then we don't have the sort of equal anger asserted from our more progressive families they seem to just want to be nice um, they're like, we just are nice people. We just want to get along. I'm like, I got it. You know, I do. And I think certainly we need to make sure that we're not pushing an ally away when we could have a relationship. But in some cases, when we see the people, we got to step up and get loud, which is why I love the sort of Utah banning the Bible thing. I think that was a great kind of, I'm not in favor of banning the Bible. I'm not in favor of banning any of these books, but like, I think that is a way of sort of pointing out something. Um, Can you explain just for people that may not be familiar what that situation was? Well, essentially the argument was in Utah, if we're going to ban all these other books for their graphic depictions of, and I put, once again, I should put that in air quotes because I'm not so sure there's not graphic depictions of anything, but essentially their violence and sexual content and gender content, well, the Bible has that too, a great deal of violence, pretty grisly stuff. So mm -hmm. you're gonna ban that, then I guess we're gonna have to ban the Bible as well. In a lot of people's minds, of course, this is banning the word God, which is you know gonna send them through the ceiling, understandably, um, but it's pointing out something. It's saying, we, this is not a way forward, folks. This is not a way to be a healthy culture society book painting just stop it <laughs> we you don't you don't you even the people who support this you don't really want this for yourselves historically time and time again you see people supporting these ideas uh, or are apathetic when they're happening and then it gets turned around and used on them and so i think i think that's just essentially the overarching thing is get engaged be part of the conversation um it's not just a conversation that queer people or BIPOC people should be having. It's a conversation that we all need to be having. Salem, would you add anything? Well, I, I think, first of all, I would I would say that talking about these things make, makes people really uncomfortable, right? People read queer books, BIPOC books, books about people who look like them and love like them or sound like them or feel like they have both the similar experiences. They do this for a reason. And in a lot of cases, those reasons are understanding and joy. People derive a lot of joy, whether it's a movie or a book or a piece of music, they get joy from it. And being told you have to get off your duff and do something about this to protect it, or to tell somebody that you have to get mad to protect something you love makes them very uncomfortable. Right, because we're at we're, at, we're normally they're asking of books. This is the books asking back, right? The books are saying we need this from you right now. So, I I think people need to ask themselves how much do these things matter to them, and if they matter, if you're a reader and you love these books, or you love these movies, or you love the music, or what whatever it is that you love, are you willing to fight for it? And if the answer is you're willing to fight for it then go to PIN America. They've got all kinds of resources. Mm -hmm. Go to the HRC, go to GLAD, go to the American Library Association. They all have information. They all have talking points. They have media packets so that you can go onto social media and just once a week put something up there about book bands suck. 
yeah. fight book bans, fight censorship, do something about it. But it needs to be a lot of voices, but people need to stand up for what they love because it can be taken away from them. People are actively trying to take this away from all of us. And we're stronger together. Or we have to have more than one or two voices. And we can't rely on these other organizations to keep carrying our water. Yeah. Chris, what's, what would you recommend people do? I definitely research, uh, know what's going on in your own hometown. I mean, like I said, this is happening a mile away and I did not know about it. So I know now in the future, I'm going to be very aware and go to the town meetings, go to the the school board meetings, go to anything that that I can, that I'm allowed to go to and speak up and say something about any sort of book banning that's happening, especially about cats versus robots and a non, non-binary character. I mean, that's, you know, mm-hmm. I yeah, so that's that's what I'm going to do. And I agree with Salem, definitely put it on social media. Book banning sucks. I think I like that. I'm going to go with that for my first tweet. Um, but yeah, for sure, share and uh, and just show your support and do everything you can. Give back the love that books have given you. I love that. It's very good. And my yes and recommendation, because I agree with all of the above, and I think the only thing I can really add is show up every single time you have an opportunity and vote like your life depends on it. And don't just vote at the federal level or at the state or provincial level. You need to look at school boards. Mm -hmm. You need to look at your city council because these things matter at the local level too. I know it can be really disheartening to feel like, you know, left leaning parties aren't doing enough and maybe I'm just not gonna vote. We can't do that. We can't afford it. And that's all for this episode. John, if people would like to connect with you online, where can they find you? Uh, The easiest way to find me is uh, my website, which is www.johncobenhaver.com. And I'm on all the socials, pretty easy to find, but um, the hub is the website. So find me there. Awesome. And Salem, what's the best way for people to connect with you? Uh, bywaterbooks.com, amblepressbooks.com, or on any of the social media apps. Thank you so much for joining us, John and Salem, for this really, really important, crucial conversation. So grateful to have your voices here today. Thank you. Thank you. And for folks listening, if you've enjoyed the show and you haven't subscribed yet, please make sure you do so you'll get notified on your podcast app whenever we release an episode. If you have a friend that you think would like it, frankly, if you have people you don't think would like it, you should still send this particular (laughs) episode anyway, because book banning is a problem. If you'd like to support the show, we have links in our show notes to our coffee, as well as our newsletter sign up, but really don't send us any money. Send money to the organizations that Salem was talking about earlier, because they need it to do this crucial work. Right. Or if you want to connect with us on your favorite social media sites, we have links in the show notes for that as well. Or you can just search for Queerly Recommended on Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, TikTok, and Twitter, or email us at podcast at queerlyrecommended.com. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.